is uh, from the league. Um, so uh, this form is the second part of a zoning forum that we held in the, at the end of June on demystifying zoning, why it matters. For those who were not able to make that session, we're gonna do a very quick review um, of both uh, of the parts that we did. While the first session focused on the history of zoning, uh, mostly beginning in 1911 uh, um, to the present, uh, this second um, part will focus on the intersection of zoning and affordable housing and what barriers need to be removed in order to increase affordable housing and make it more equitable for everyone. I wanna thank our partners who helped with the outreach, uh, the Greater Richmond American Association of University Women, Housing Forward Virginia, Partnership for Housing Affordability, Richmond Association of Realtors, Virginia Housing Alliance, and the VCU Masters of Urban and Regional Planning. Before I uh, introduce our speakers, um, I wanted to ask everyone to, um, if you have questions during the presentations, if you would please put them in chat, we will get to them after both speakers. Um, uh, and we should have about um, 20 minutes or so, so there should be plenty of time for questions and answers. Uh, we will also have a brief uh, evaluation link that will be put in chat um, at the end of the session that we hope you can respond to. If um, you don't get a chance, we'll also be sending it out uh, by Eventbrite. So I'm gonna start by introducing um, Matthew Weinstein, and you can just maybe um, Give us give us a wave, Matthew. Uh, he is one. Of, Matthew is one of the authors of the recent release, Zoning and Segregation in Virginia, Parts One and Two, that was prepared by McGuire Woods Consulting. Uh, Matt will give a brief review of Part One and focus on Part Two, which were um, state and local zoning recommendations. Matt is a land use and zoning attorney at McGuire Woods in, in Tysons. Uh, and he works mainly in Arlington uh, County. Uh, he is on the boards of Habitat for Humanity of Northern Virginia and the NAACP, where he uh, was uh, named member of the year in 2020. Um, of interest to the leaguers on this call, uh, Matt serves on the Arlington Electoral Board. Uh, he received his JD from George Mason and BA from Washington University uh, in St. Louis. Uh, Tom Jacobson, who will actually speak first, will talk about zoning and its connection to affordable housing and ways to increase affordable housing using zoning. Mm -hmm. Tom is adjunct uh, uh, faculty at the um, instructor at um, um, in the VCU urban planning. Um, and he teaches land use and planning, uh, which is one of the many things he does uh, uh, during his retirement. Before he retired, he was the director of revitalization for nine years and uh, director of planning for 17 years for Chesterfield County. And before that, he taught, interestingly enough, in South Dakota and North North Dakota. Uh, he has a BA, uh, BS from University of Minneapolis of Minnesota uh, in civil engineering and MS from the University of Minnesota in environmental planning. Both Matt and Tom have ties to Minneapolis, which you'll see later on is relevant to this particular forum. <laughs> As you can see, both of them um, have lots of experience and are passionate about what, um, what they do. So sit back, enjoy, and learn from them. So uh, Tom, uh, take it away. You can do your screen sharing and begin. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Alice, very much. And again, I appreciate all of your interest in this topic and your hard work for improving our community, our metropolitan area, because I wish there was more of us that had time to do that. 
So let me again show you slides. So hopefully this uh, can make some sense to you. I like taking lots of pictures. So I hope to sprinkle liberal numbers of uh, photographs here that may help you. All right. So what's the problem? Housing affordability, what you get for the house. And um, I'm gonna start with a couple high level discussions that uh, we talked about in the first session before I start going into talking about how we can change zoning to be positive for ho housing affordability instead of a, a negative in some local communities. So first, there was a recent uh, work that Harvard University does, and they put this out every year, that uh, does a um, look at the national ho housing situation. All right, so here's, here's the top points that I took out of their last report. 30% of American households are paying an un unaffordable mortgage or rent payment. And again, that's defined also by the term of 30%. Um, don't get the two confused, but 30% is kind of the uh, guideline. If you pay more for your housing of 30% or more, um, it, it, uh, it, it's looked at as a, as a problem starting to be unaffordable for you, making sacrifices in your other expenses. Now, also, besides that uh, large number and in, increasing number over years, of Americans that pay too much for their housing, there also has been building over the last several years an imbalance between the demand for housing units and the supply. And the last figure that uh, Harvard has tapped on that was about 3.8 million homes. Now, this also affects the rental market. Um, because as people who want to be able to buy a house and they can't, they will um, you know, uh, increasingly continue to rent as new renters moved in to the rental market. So there's also been significant price pressure on rents. In fact, my youngest son who lives in Raleigh, uh, he and his girlfriend have been saving money for, um, for a house. They've gone backwards this last year, haven't they? They've saved more money, but the cost of housing in Raleigh has gone up. Also, the mortgage uh, interest rate that they would have to pay has, has literally doubled over the last year. Um, also, um, they um, in the apartment that they rent, they got a 25% rent increase. For one year, 25% rent increase. So I think a good example, very personal for me, of, of uh, the situation in housing in a probably a, a market that is um, more stressed than our market here in Richmond, although uh, I think we're pretty close. The second graphic on the right hand side of the screen also illustrates another major problem in America. If that what this does is just track the income um, gains um, over a, a time period. And in the period after World War II, up until about the 1980s, the income increase, percentage increase for low, um, medium, and high income people were pretty well tracking each other. And look what happened since. Look at the division, the median representing the uh, you know, the uh, kind of the, the mid-range, the middle class, as well as the, the lower income uh, households, rather families, um, stagnated. Those at the top continue to rise. So you have seen the affordable housing issue, which has always been a problem for the bottom 5% or the bottom 10% very, very stressed, but the issue is moving into the middle class. The issue is not just um, government efforts to try to take more money and help subsidize costs and rents for people um, at the very, very low end of, of the income scale. The uh, problem is spreading into the middle class. Also, our housing characteristics and as you look forward, it's different than it was in the past, right? We had built a lot of housing that were um, had, had 
kind of dominated by the suburban, you know, four four bedroom houses that we built to to um, meet the demand from um, family um, families with children and uh, and and larger families. The market going forward is going to uh, be increasingly um, single people as well as uh, a couples two pe two people. What this chart shows you is for the next 10 years, about 10 years going forward, the size of the need, the increased number of housing units we have to build for these increasing households. Single person households are growing faster. Um, two person households are growing faster than the um, type of households that would want a larger um, um, single family house. All right, now let me switch to zoning. Land use zoning is government's control of the use pattern, physical characteristics of development. The picture here, here was, you know, literally the, the history of zoning was to separate uses, separate land uses that were not good neighbors with each other. And back, if you remember back in those early days of the uh, 20th century or from your history books for all of you, but looking back at the um, at, at our, our country back uh, 100 plus years ago, we had a lot of heavy industry. You also had a, a, a dirtier types of smaller businesses. The idea was not to have them adjacent to single family neighborhoods, multifamily neighborhoods, residential neighborhoods, separate uses that are not good neighbors to each other. Um, and also for um, everybody's uh, basic understanding, the zoning authority is basically vested in local governments especially in Virginia, although uh, local governments, what they can do in terms of zoning is set by state laws, whatever uh, guidelines or mandatory restrictions or mandatory duties that the state assigns to local governments in terms of, of regulating land use. All right, so um, a couple of quick points about the relationship between zoning and housing affordability. Single family home zoning districts, of which we have a lot of communities, established areas, their low density um, zoning districts are exclusively for single family houses and other related uses, not allowing uh, duplexes, fourplexes, or, or more smaller scale multifamily. Typically, single family uh, districts set up minimum lot sizes. Um, with, along with other kinds of, uh, of, of what we call bulk standards or regulations guiding what's built on the lot that is owned sing, single family. Zoning standards also set out the improvements that are can be made and required to be made uh, for development, paving the streets, uh, uh, public water and sewer, drainage facilities, water quality facilities, street lights, sidewalks, bike paths, um, neighborhood parks um, or, or pools um, can be negotiated by the local government with a large scale uh, development through a, 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 a little um, more sophisticated zoning technique. Zoning proffers, and I'm going to explain those in a, a little more detail in a minute, they provide a minimum um, um, can, can mandate for a specific zoning case, a minimum house size to be built within the boundaries of that particular zoning case. Um, zoning has resulted in not all communities, but many communities that did not want um, um, higher density development, they can um, um, zone out in their community apartment types of, of uses, condos, townhouses, or other types of multifamily zoning. And also communities through zoning can prevent the construction of mobile home parks or different types of development using manufactured home housing uh, of today. So these, uh, the general use of zoning to exclude people, a uh, lower income people um, and um, types of, of housing um, is generally called exclusionary zoning. So that's the uh, term 
exclusionary zoning. Now, as a background, um, one of the huge problems isn't just necessarily the local government or the planners or the um, um, uh, elected officials in terms of, uh, of not zoning for uh, different types of housing uses. It tends to be the community. Uh, the term NIMBY means not in my backyard. Um, I spent many years at zoning hearings and discussions where people were just opposed to development next to them. They don't like um, um, development um, next to them. They liked, uh, they moved out just beyond the edge of the developing parts of Chesterfield County and they loved it. And they didn't realize they were moving into a growing area. Um, the, the, the typical fears residents have and bring to these meetings are negative impact on property values and increasing crime. And of course, especially in the past, but still alive today, you do have um, fear and opposition to lower income residents, as well as those of, uh, of, of Blacks or other minorities moving into their area. So it is depending on where you are in our country, it still is a factor. I think we're getting better at it. Um, most of our discussions um, have focused on negative uh, impact on property values and a potential increase of crime. And I'll talk a little bit more about that later on too. But the communities themselves can be very vocal through the zoning process. Now, we're unique in Virginia. Um, we have a tool that's called proffer. A proffer is a voluntary offer by a person or developer seeking to rezone their property. And after hearing some of the opposition to their property, they have the ability to impose additional development standards on themselves, on the property that they are seeking zoning. Okay, so the, um, the, the problem this has created, let me back up. In many instances, proffers have led to higher quality development in Virginia. Uh, the problem associated with it, especially with residential development, it also allowed a means by which the developer can satisfy the opposition of neighbors to building smaller houses. They could uh, submit a proffer that says, I will not build a house smaller than 2,400 square feet. I will not. Um, I will only build single-family houses in my development. I will remove the ability to do other duplexes or other types of uses. So, um, proffers have been used depending on where you are in Virginia by different local governments in response to opposition, and then typically local governments go along with it because it it it. Um, lessens the uh, controversy on a particular zoning case. So um, looking at uh, history in Chesterfield, this is a, a large area of Chesterfield County, generally between Midlothian Turnpike and on the, on the um, southern boundary. Um, um, this is Lux Lane with Courthouse Road over here on the right-hand side of the screen. I brought this up because this is an area that is almost all single-family houses. It was an area developed uh, primarily in the 70s and the 80s and pretty typical of parts of suburban areas where a lot of housing, it was just uh, large single-family houses with all the cul-de-sacs. Um, and uh, represents a lot of what we have built within the, the suburban um, areas of our, of our nation and certainly our metropolitan area. Now, I will say um, um, today there are infill projects, especially those that are closer to the major arterial road that are um, higher density. There are some townhouse units. There are some um, um, fourplexes that are for um, um, for, for um, 55 and older um, that can be built within the area that was skipped over fronting on uh, Courthouse Road. But it gives you, I just want to give you a picture of a large swaths of what we had built within the area after World War II were, um, were, were for single family houses exclusively. Now, zoning can be used as a positive tool. 
for addressing and um, recognizing the market and the need for different types of housing units. Primarily, it's a tool that will um, encourage the market to build different, a more variety of housing. Um, but there is one tool that's called inclusionary zoning. Notice the opposite word of exclusionary zoning done purposely that um, can require that the uh, developer use and, uh, um, and set aside units within a development for uh, what we would call more affordable, less expensive housing. Um, I'm gonna go through real quickly, uh, talking about um, different techniques to be able to they're listed here that will be able to um, use zoning as a positive tool. So exclusionary zoning, Matt, I noticed you use this, uh, this uh, uh, graphic too. So this gives you a, um, a, a kind of picture a nice summary picture of where localities can use this exclusion, this uh, inclusionary zoning tool and some of the complications of it. So if you will focus first on the darker color, the darker um, um, brown color, these were communities that started off um, with providing a requirement that developers set aside a certain number of units for um, um, less costly housing within their new developments. Northern Virginia, um, Albemarle County, um, and um, primarily uh, focused there. Then after this, these communities were working actively, the state legislature decided to make that tool also available for other local governments in Virginia. That's the tan color all across the, the, the state. Um, however, what's allowed by the other communities has far more restrictions. So for example, um, the, the, the individual rest of the state um, would require um, the local governments to be, to be able to um, um, give bonuses in terms of, uh, of development, increased units for the development of that property in exchange for the voluntary um, of construction of affordable units by that developer. 734 communities in the United States as of about a year ago have inclusionary housing programs. Um, a little more detail about Virginia. Um, for most developers, um, it's voluntary. The developer has the choice whether or not to include and be part of this program. Um, the uh, the uh, first Virginia code, which is 2305, um, required a density bonus, and they had a formula, depending on how many percentage units you give, how many affordable housing units you, pro you, you provide. You also, it, it also had a large number of other very detailed requirements. There was a attempt to be improve this um, law in last year. Uh, some will look at that as this at this um, legislation as an improvement. Um, however, from a, um, water, a wider perspective, um, I, I don't think it is an improvement. The developer still has the option of whether to participate or not. It still involves density bonuses. It also allows a uh, local governments to reduce fees or reduce some of those um, standards of, of development. Now, take the sidewalk off or um, we're not gonna put streetlights at all you know, with, within the, the neighborhood, those types of things. So um, governments cannot mandate um, that developers participate in this program. And to my knowledge, as of uh, um, just this last year, there's just little to no developer interest in this program. Even the communities that were on the um, um, listing on the bottom here, um, in our area, it's the city of Richmond, and interestingly, Amelia County, that uh, as well as the other 11 communities um, throughout the state that are using the um, inclusionary um, zoning provisions, um, um, the, the interest of developers and their success with this program has been very, very limited. Okay, now you can also improve your single family housing zoning districts 
there are ways to be able to, you can reduce minimum lot sizes, allowing smaller lots so that smaller houses can be built um, and therefore saving costs to a eventual uh, purchaser. You can reduce setbacks. So like the picture on the top of the screen on the right, you can pull the houses forward. Uh, typically on a sidewalk with a very limited um, front yard setback, you can encourage in your community to developers. So it's one of the issues developers talk about is that that um, it is very difficult for them to build smaller houses. The profit margin is much smaller. Um, and, and much more limited. Um, they also have to look at what the cost of land is versus what the cost of their house is gonna be. A lot of banks will use a formula in terms of their funding. And you also have the ability to allow what we call an ADU, which is an accessory dwelling unit um, on a lot of a single family house so that you have a second smaller unit in the back or in part of the main house. This is a diagram of an accessory dwelling unit. Um, again, you can um, put it uh, historically, there was a lot of the upstairs of a, of a garage in the back that um, had um, um, the parking coming in from the alley um, where that, that uh, space was used as a second unit, whether it's for your mother-in-law or your, your son or daughter when they come back after going to school or whatever the circumstances can be, but also be able to rent it out. To, to someone make a little more income for the home. More common in the past, uh, bef uh, before World War II than now, but in getting increasing interest. So um, this unit then can be incorporated into the house uh, with a separate entrance, or it could be a, um, a, a separate smaller building in the, in the back. The issues with ADU tend to revolve around the development standards. Even communities that do allow accessory dwelling units, the parking requirement has to work. The setback has to work. Um, in some instances, um, communities, depending on accessibility to local uh, transportation, public transportation, it, uh, it may not be necessary. Um, so the, the, the um, I was just on a Norfolk doing uh, training with their planning commission last week. And um, they do uh, allow uh, accessory dwelling units, but they also are taking a careful look at their uh, detailed requirements. You can also build higher density apartments, but uh, designed, in, especially in, in, um, in maybe like in the Chester Village Green Project, the right inside of the screen, uh, designed to be located above the, uh, the small shops on the first floor, um, or um, you know, several buildings, um, in, um, very nice design that are designed up on the sidewalk. Therefore, they can get more density with a very nice looking building, with the example here, three stories or the uh, seven story building down in Charlotte. So that is an option to provide more um, apartments to your unit on, on land that's available, as long as the ordinance does allow a uh, density that fits what, um, what, what uh, a developer can build and provide units at uh, reasonable cost. And again, Matt, I love this, this uh, diagram too. There's this term that's called missing middle housing. Uh, the idea stretching from the single family detached home over on the left-hand side of the screen, all the way up to the apartments, the larger scale apartments that are pretty typically built today um, in cities as well as the suburbs. There's a whole host of other types of housing units at a scale that spans the differences between a traditional apartment building and a detached single family house. So where most of you are used to townhouses or row houses that you may see in the city, townhouses um, in, in edge areas of, of the city or the suburbs, um, but also fourplexes or a variety of other types types of smaller scale multifamily units. So um, again, zoning can permit these types of units. The uh, dense, typical zoners may um, allow flexibility in units and just have an overall uh, density um, um, cap uh, on the development, typically based on their comprehensive plan. Um, 
couple of examples of kind of mixed housing uh, income. Historically, um, it was very common in Richmond to be able to have small, smaller scale apartments next to duplexes, next to single family houses, but also planned communities of today are doing the same thing. So this is a finer grain of uh, mixing of, of different land uses. Another example, um, you can mix what uh, the people in the development industry call pods. The idea of having um, at a, at a, in a neighborhood in a planned development to be able to have um, houses that are similar to each other, but a nice transition to different types of, of uses. So the important thing here is that the zoning is a implementation tool of a comprehensive plan. So the comprehensive plan typically sets the density range of residential to be located within that area outlined by the plan. And then communities will normally follow that with their um, designation of a zoning district um, consistent with the adopted comprehensive plan. The comprehensive plans can be can be purposely designed to allow housing type and variety, just setting overall density um, um, guidelines to be able to match their infrastructure that they're planning to serve that area. The zoning will have some other um, different types of techniques, though, that will allow, therefore, building different housing types. So in the Chester um, Village Green Project in Little Chester and Southern in Chesterfield, they have uh, housing units in the core of the commercial center of, of their area north of Route 10 where you have uh, multifamily housing above um, offices or above restaurants or above retail um, uses or shops or services. Then they have single family housing in kind of the middle area. And they have another area with multifamily because uh, the plan is to have another road located back here um, that is a smaller, much smaller scale um, units, two-story um, smaller units that are that are um, leased out to people wanting an apartment. Then there's also some um, tighter housing units that's located um, here too. Now this is kind of what's called a, a kind of pod development. You see how you have some similarity of units, um, but they're at a small scale. All of this is uh, uh, is permitted through a technique planners call planned unit development. At a finer grain, my son's, um, one of my older son's uh, uh, neighborhood in suburban Raleigh um, allows duplexes next to single family houses. It also has uh, townhouses, three-story townhouses next to single family houses. So you can finally um, build a neighborhood that has a finer grain of uh, changing uh, different and including different types of housing units. At the more um, walkable and, and uh, denser scale, um, we have a technique that's called transit-oriented development. So this is a, a technique that is actually promoted by the state law two years ago for the larger counties and larger cities with, within our state. Um, the Paul Station, shown on the screen here, you know, has generated interest, transit-oriented development housing next to it because people can walk a short distance and be able to get on, on the Pulse um, um, uh, transit system, the Pulse bus. Also for the counties and areas that are um, at the beginning of public transportation, like Chesterfield, the planners there are using a um, mixed-use node concept the circles are different densities of, of mixing multifamily housing in with uh, jobs, um, um, office uses, and um, services and re retail uses at those locations. In that, this we started actually this way back in the um, mid 19, uh, late 1980s, working through our or ordinance so that the land use pattern would help fit transit when it would come. The um, possibilities exist um, at these locations with good transit service to be able to reduce parking um, and also encourage uh, walking to jobs and services for people. Um, the state is also encouraging localities 
um, to incorporate into its comprehensive plan strategies to promote manufactured housing as a source of affordable housing so that they would zone for manufactured housing at appropriate locations. Chesterfield for years has had a um, manufactured home subdivision. These are like double wides. Some people would call them a double wide mobile home, but the, the, they allow in this area, the owner of that home to also own the land. The fundamental problem with um, mobile home parks is that the land is ownership is separated from the ownership of the units. And when that land rises in value and the owner wants to sell it for someone to build something more intense, the um, typically lower income people who own those units, many of them have nowhere to go. Their unit is too old to move. Um, there's no place to move it. And it has been a huge problem as Chesterfield, as we worked along Route 1, trying as we were redeveloping some of those very old mobile home parks. This is one solution to be able to look at uh, providing a, a subdivision and then zoning for manufactured homes so that at those locations, the owner um, of the home can also own the land. Now let's talk about Minneapolis. Um, Minneapolis, interestingly, as they were putting their most recent master plan for the city together, did a lot of outreach within their community. Um, and um, part of their goal at the beginning of the plan was, can they use the plan to create more equity within the, their community? Um, can they allow the lower income neighborhoods, people to have more opportunity to be able to advance in wealth and income? What they heard back in those meetings was housing, housing, housing. They wanted the opportunity the, to be able to have different types of housing spread across the city, not just uh, um, multifamily, large scale uh, apartments just located in certain neighborhoods. So from that came their innovative um, plan and follow through with their zoning ordinance to allow duplexes and triplexes um, in their previous zoning districts that were restricted to single family um, units. So their um, lowest density, um, Zoning district now allows single family houses, duplexes and triplexes. Plus what they did is um, also on all their major road corridors and corridors where there was transit, as well as the key areas, the downtown area, as well as some of the key areas by the university and other um, close in neighborhoods. They also um, increased the density of uh, multifamily units in those areas. And they did um, adopted an ordinance, an inclusionary zoning ordinance that required developers building buildings of 20 units or more that they also provide affordable housing. Now, uh, I've given you here the results from 2020. There were spread across the entire city, 34 duplexes and nine triplexes were built. And that, of course, pales in comparison to the 6,000 dwelling units that were built in multifamily um, uh, buildings across the city in other areas. Now, I do want to issue here a caution to everybody. Um, what happened in the um, 1950s and 60s is many cities zoned their neighborhoods close to downtown for dense multifamily development. And the idea was they were really following kind of an organic model of city planning that was popular at the time, that essentially areas close to downtown are going to increase in, in density. And what happened, though, is as developers looked at their older buildings and had to make a decision, well, I could build a sixplex on my property. And if they were interested in doing that, what they did is they under maintained the existing structure on the land. So you had, when I was working as a, a planner in Sioux Falls, South Dakota, 
uh, we had major deterioration in these older neighborhoods. And we were able to figure out that a lot of property owners were just purposely under maintaining their buildings because they wanted to build a sixplex or a, a fourplex uh, on that property. So we've got to be careful how what types of units that we add to a single family neighborhood. A duplex, I don't think, gives encouragement to someone to be able to under maintain an older single family house. But we've got to be cautious and we got to do this correctly in communities that want to be able to change their single family zoning districts. In fact, one of my jobs in Sioux Falls was to work in all the neighborhoods around downtown and rezone those areas uh, for what was ap appropriate. In many instances, bringing it back to single family and or duplex zoning. Uh, real quickly, I want to go through uh, the NIMBY issue. Um, it's a very important to listen to these people because what happens is in many cases, they are very highly emotional. They're not using their rational um, um, thinking yet, and they have real fear on their negative um, impact on them, their principal source of investment, their home. They are fearful of what their property values are going to be if something different uh, gets built across the street from them or down the block or even in the wider neighborhood. And it can be very, very emotional at these types of meetings. So the key is to work with people, neighborhoods that are opposed to different types of housing units. And over time, it takes several meetings usually to move towards more of a rational discussion. We did two studies uh, in the Richmond area um, by um, VCU and uh, George Mason to look at, the, at this issue and find that the fear is really unwarranted. So first we had our Partnership for Housing Affordability um, hire George Mason University um, to look at 11 projects in our region, apartments, and single family houses, excuse me, apartments that were near single family houses or dense townhouses that were close to single family houses and document what was happening in terms of, of, of crime rate and property values assessments on, on and um, sa sales of homes in, in those areas. The study is available um, at the site I have on the bottom of the screen. Um, the the major conclusion of JMU study was that the projects not only were not negative, they had positive impacts on surrounding neighborhoods with relatively strong home price appreciation and lower crime levels. Use that if you get involved in some discussion. So we've been giving these to planning commissioners as we do our VCU training for planning commissioners across the state. We did a more limited study at VCU. Um, I was leading the study of the jobs affordable housing balance in our region several years ago. We studied um, six lower cost townhouse and apartment projects uh, within our region. And again, uh, the, the, the primary um, conclusion of that study was there's no notable long-term impacts resulting in a crime rate, property values, and property sales. And again, that should be available at our Center for Urban Regional Analysis for anybody that would want to look at it and use it. Okay, I am done. So um, Matt, if you wanna take over and can answer questions later. Thank you, uh, thank you, Tom, that was really interesting. Yep, thank you, Tom. That was very helpful. And uh, as you all will see, there's a bit of, um, not overlap, but there's a lot of synergy between my presentation and Tom's presentation. And I think, Tom, you have to stop sharing your screen so I can share mine. Okay, yeah. All right. Great. Um, well, just uh, before I get started, when we were doing a dry run, um, for whatever reason, if I do a, a a slideshow and I'm trying to share my screen and I advance the slides, you all can't see it. So I'm just gonna walk through them um, this way. So thank you for your patience. Well, again, my name is Matthew Weinstein. I am a land use and real estate associate at McGuire Woods in the Tyson's office. And as Alice mentioned, I'm also on the Arlington Electoral Board. So I wanna thank you all for the work the league does on voter access and voter education. You do fantastic work. And we always see you as a model for 
the way to do that sort of work. So thank you. Um, so today I'm gonna to talk about zoning and segregation in Virginia in our part one and part two reports. I'll very quickly go through part one because I, my colleague Scott Adams presented to you all during the first session. But then I'll talk about part two, which we released I think in May of this year, which includes specific state and local policy recommendations to expand housing access and address some of the uh, racial legacies of zoning in Virginia. So uh, this is the McGuire Woods and McGuire Consulting Zoning and Segregation Working Group. It's um, uh, made up of a number of lawyers, planners, and consultants from McGuire Woods. And we started our group, I wanna say in June of 2020, so shortly after the murder of George Floyd, we read a book called The Color of Law by Richard Rothstein. I really urge all of you to read it if you have not. And that book really gets into the details of the history of zoning and housing finance and covenants, but it really had a profound impact on uh, the neighborhoods we live in and the world we live in. So I really encourage you to look at that. And coming out of that um, book club, for lack of a better term, we decided we want to study the history of zoning and, and race in Virginia and then think of some solutions as people who are involved in the practice of real estate and land use and also uh, people who are involved in their relations about you know, thinking of solutions to help address the issues we raised in part one. All right, so part one was a report released, released in, I guess it was 2021, uh, you know, a good example of zoning and racial segregation was back in, I believe it was um, 1911, Booker T. Washington wanted to start a uh, African-American college in the town of Ashland. And shortly after that, Ashland passed a segregation ordinance prohibiting blacks live with whites. Uh, that's one of the first instances that uh, a locality passed an ordinance to segregate people by the color of their skin. And then shortly thereafter, between 1911 and 1916, there were a number of localities in Virginia that adopted uh, racial zoning ordinances, Ashland, Richmond, Norfolk, Portsmouth, Roanoke, and City of Falls Church, uh, close to where I live in Arlington, were, were some of those localities. Richmond tried again in 1929 to pass a racial zoning ordinance relying on Virginia's, Virginia's anti-miscegenation law. In the 1930s, the U.S. Supreme Court struck that down. And what happened after that was redlining, which I'm sure most of you have heard of, uh, restrictive covenants prohibiting people to sell their homes to minorities, and other ways to really keep neighborhoods from, uh, keep the African Americans and other minorities from having access to neighborhoods, single family neighborhoods. The legacy of that in Arlington, where I live, I find fairly fascinating. This slide is provided by Arlington County as part of their missing middle study, which we'll talk about in a little while. And it shows in the crosshatched areas, parts of the county with a population of 70% or greater uh, white, and then yellow is the part of the county that is zoned exclusively for single family housing. So this is the real legacy of of economic segregation through zoning and also racial segregation through zoning, where you had you know, really people who could tap into generational wealth being able to afford these uh, homes in these single family neighborhoods. And the way they did that was they were able to buy these homes back in the 20s, 30s, 40s, and 50s, while other parts of the county like uh, down here in, in Knock and, and others, um, it's where the Af where African Americans live. They didn't really necessarily have the generational wealth allowing them to buy and purchase property in the single family zoning districts. So with that quick background, I will launch into our part two report recommendations. So this being Virginia, um, I think Tom alluded to this, uh, Virginia is what's called a Dillon rule state, meaning the General Assembly, local, local governments really don't have the power to do something unless that power is granted them by the General Assembly. Land use and real estate is one area in which localities have substantial power. So we really think that local governments have a very important role to play in uh, increasing housing supply and housing access. So our first recommendation is to include housing equality in every concept, comprehensive plan. And Roanoke actually did this in their most recent comprehensive plan update. And the goal is to really just look at localities history acknowledge the role that zoning and segregation and race had um, 
on housing and, and the current state of uh, this, the locality and thinking of ways to address that. So again, Roanoke is a great example of that. Every locality has to update their comp comprehensive plans. So we, we say locality should do this. The second is to update zoning ordinances and maps to encourage mixed use of higher residential density in existing commercial areas. We recognize that, you know, Virginia is a very diverse state. So this recommendation may be more applicable up here in Northern Virginia or certain parts of the Richmond area. But really the goal is to allow for more density where density is appropriate because at the end of the day, a lot of the housing uh, crisis comes down to a supply and demand problem, which I think Tom really talked about in great detail. And if the demand continues to go up and the supply remains restricted because of zoning, it's gonna be really hard to make housing affordable. So we think where appropriate zoning ordinances, maps should encourage mixed use with high residential density in existing commercial areas. Related to that, we suggest localities offer affordable housing incentives using density bonuses, parking reductions, and tax abatement. And this gets to the inclusionary zoning um, recommendation that or discussion that Tom had earlier, where building any sort of project is really a math exercise and to build housing you have to make sure that the numbers work and affordable housing in particular is you know expensive to build uh, parking for affordable housing is just as expensive to build as parking for market rate and allowing developers to get additional uh, density through the approval process to help mitigate some of those costs means it would be more likely that those developers can build affordable housing uh, here in Arlington, we have an accept we have an affordable dwelling ordinance allows um, developers to get bonus density for providing affordable housing on site, off site, or also con making contributions to the affordable housing investment fund. And that's something we think locality all localities should look at. Tom also talked about proffers, and we think that localities should adopt proportional proffer guidelines adapted to housing size and income restrictions, affordable housing incentives using. Uh, density bonuses, parking reductions, and tax abatement. And, uh, you know, I don't really work in many jurisdictions with proffers, but I think really what we're getting at here is that proffers are costs that are, pat you know, the developers pay as part of the uh, rezoning, the, the conditional zoning approvals. And often those costs are passed right on down to whoever's purchasing the property. Um, and that just leads to more expensive development. So we think that Proffer guidelines should really be tailored when appropriate to housing size and income restrictions for affordable housing. And then the uh, the next local government or local recommendation is to promote greater home ownership for low income and moderate income households. And we've talked a lot about rental, and rental is obviously a huge issue. But home ownership is one that uh, affordable home ownership is one that I think really deserves a little bit more attention because. Home ownership is one of the historic ways for people to build wealth and having uh, tools like community land trust or rent to buy or, or things like that, or home ownership assistance programs, things like that, really help people to purchase their first home, whether it be a single family home, duplex, triplex, whatever it may be, and uh, really get into the home uh, ownership experience system recognizing that home ownership may not be appropriate for everyone, but we think it's something localities should focus on. And then you saw this graphic from Tom's presentation, but uh, we recommend the localities add missing middle housing types to residential zones by right. And this is a very, very significant and uh, complicated discussion here in Arlington that we're having right now. The county board uh, recommended, not that I shouldn't say they recommended, the county staff has put together a proposal allowing duplexes, triplexes, up to eight plexes uh, by right in single family zoning districts throughout the county. And it should be uh, considered by the county board by the end of the year. And it's been very controversial. I mean, I live in a single family home in a neighborhood about two and a half miles from Washington, DC. And a lot of my neighborhood has signs up opposing this. And a lot of the concerns people have are related to parking and uh, you know school uh, student generations from schools, stormwater things like that. But you know, as Tom mentioned, people you know 
they're, they're, they're afraid of change. My neighborhood's been around since the 1840s. And I think people are just, uh, you know, concerned about changing the way the neighborhood they've come to know and love um, will look. And that's a, a valid concern. But, you know, if you can't allow duplex or triplexes or quadplexes two and a half miles from the nation's capital, it's going to be difficult to make this argument anywhere. So we'll see what the county board does. But we really think by diversing, diversifying housing types by allowing duplexes, triplexes, up to live, uh, live work uh, units can really help solve some of that supply issue that I talked about earlier. It's not a be all end all solution, but it'll help get us there. And then recognizing that no locality is an island in Virginia, we, rec we recommend that localities cooperate with other localities to coordinate regional housing supply. So what happens in Arlington is not that different than what happens in, in Alexandria or Fairfax. And I think housing issues in Richmond probably aren't significantly different than parts of Henrico and Chesterfield. So we really urge localities to work together on regional housing supply. All right, so moving on to state policy recommendations. Again, recognizing Virginia's Dillon rule state. So if the General Assembly passed any of these recommendations, it would be uh, it would behoove the localities to follow them. So the first one is to amend state law and require comprehensive plans to measure and address housing equality. This is something that was done in Seattle and also to a degree in Minneapolis. And as Alice alluded to, both Tom and I are originally from Minneapolis. So it's interesting to see the steps they've taken in recent years to address this sort of issue. The next is to have the Virginia Department of Housing and Community Development provide technical and support to localities who are taking out any of the work we, we uh, suggest they do in our report because one thing localities do not like are unfunded mandates. And we suggest that the Department of Housing and Community Development help these localities by providing indices to measure racial and economic segregation, GIS and census data support, model ordinances if any local ordinances need to be passed to adopt some of our recommendations, and then also provide education and advocacy for increasing housing choices. This map should look very similar to <laughs> familiar to you all based off of Tom's presentation, but where we're coming at from this is basically, uh, you know, there, as Tom mentioned, there are two different types of inclusionary zoning ordinances. The light orange is a, a much more restrictive than the dark orange, which means most of these localities really haven't adopted ordinances um, that really create more affordable housing. But we, we think that localities or the state should pass legislation to basically open up inclusionary zoning for most localities that aren't already doing it. And then finally, uh, we suggest requiring local zoning uh, to allow accessory, accessory dwelling units in single family districts. This is very similar to our recommendation for uh, missing middle housing types where we think that Supply is a significant issue and a significant component of what we're all talking about. And while ADU certainly will not be, uh, you know, complete game changers, they are a tool in the toolkit to help increase housing supply. Uh, here in Arlington, the county board approved an ordinance in 2019, I believe, uh, loosening some setback requirements and height requirements for ADUs and allowing them by rights, not by special exception. And the result of that is there, there's been, I think about 70 to 100 ADUs built since then. So, you know, th these units can be rental, long-term rental, in some cases, short-term rental, or in some cases, um, you know, somewhat affordable home ownership opportunities for people as well, because obviously it's gonna be a little less expensive than buying the house itself. So. That is the last state recommendation we have. And at this point, I'm happy to take any questions now or here's my email, feel free to shoot me an email. Be happy to send you our part one report, part two report if you're interested as well. So I will pause there and I guess we can open it to questions. All right, thank you, uh, Matt. That was excellent. Um, both of you did a wonderful job um, and I'm sure there must be some questions um, that folks have. Do we, Carol, do we have any? I don't have any yet. People may be typing them in now. Um, I was going to um, ask if Matt could give me the name of the um, book that he recommended. That Color we, of I, Law. 
the yeah. color of law. Yeah. Color um, of law. Of law. Okay. Right. Right. State. right. So the yeah. um yes, the the state league's affordable housing committee uh did a report on uh racial disparities in housing. And um I can share that with folks as well that we cited uh Rothstein's book a lot. Mm -hmm. I, Rothstein is the name of the author? Yes, that, that Richard Rothstein. Okay. Yeah, I was trying to find my bookshelf right over there, right? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> I, I also wanted to mention, um, you know, when we talk about um, accessory dwelling units, uh, the other thing that they do is can help, um, you know, seniors age in place. Mm -hmm. um, it's a really good tool for you know, families who want to bring their mother or father back to live to make that affordable for them and also you know, um, enable them to be close to their, you know, to their parents. Um, and it can help with very low income people that own a home that are having a difficult time if they can get a nonprofit or whatever to help them build an accessory dwelling unit, they can rent it out and give them additional income. Okay, hey, uh, there is a question. Who typically initiates zoning changes in a community in support of affordable housing? Does this I happen internally in local government um, or through external pressure from interested organizations? There, there's uh, two major methods, I guess. Um, the property owner has the right to initiate a rezoning case on their property. So they would make application to the local government. That uh, um, um, application will be reviewed by the planning commission. The planning commission holds a public hearing. They make a recommendation to the elected board. The elected board makes a, um, holds a public hearing, and then they make the final decision. Also, the local government and the staff working through the local government can initiate a rezoning as well. Typically, that's done not on a parcel basis or for a new development. It, it is done in conjunction with the change of their comprehensive plan. So say they want to have an old deteriorating commercial corridor and they want to encourage property owners to redevelop that corridor and um, allow them more uses, maybe higher intensity of uses, change the standards. So government could initiate a, a, th that type of zoning. I think there have been cases and maybe Matt, you know more about this than I do. Um, I don't think there, a local government could initiate a application on one single property. I don't think it's done very often. Yeah, no, thanks for that, Tom. And yeah, it, Tom's absolutely right on how you know land use cases are brought forward and, and broader policies at the local level are typically initiated by the local governments themselves. So um, here in Arlington, Missing Middle was something the county board brought forward or members of the county board made a policy priority. So they directed staff to do the research and come up with zoning ordinance proposals and things like that. Another similar uh, policy that County Board, I think it's in 2017, was a housing conservation district in certain parts of the county. And the idea was to preserve some market rate affordable housing units. Um, so those sort of broad countywide programs are typically initiated by the locality. Sometimes there's kind of a, both a private landowner and the county work hand in hand. I'm thinking of a policy idea where um, there was a project here in Arlington earlier this year, which was in a zoning district that only allowed buildings up to six stories. And I think dwelling units per, but developer wanted to do a hundred percent committed affordable project. And to make that viable, they needed additional height. So the county moved forward with the zoning ordinance amendment saying for a hundred percent committed affordable projects, you can get up to 12 stories in height. And uh, that allowed that project to go forward and, and build some committed affordable units in an area that would have otherwise happened. So they often can work hand in hand, um, but broader policy changes are typically driven by localities. 
but the public too can advocate for yes. uh, changes to zoning as part of the comprehensive plan process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. The example of that um, at in our state affordable housing committee, there uh, one of the league members is working with um, Prince William County to get them to be more specific in their plan um, uh, in terms of what they intend to do. How are they going to meet their affordable housing needs? So it can come from public advocacy as well. Mm -hmm. Very good. Um, we have another question. Do we have any numbers on the potential rise for multi-generational housing? Hmm. Um, that, that's interesting. Um, in fact, I was having the, that discussion with the uh, Norfolk uh, Planning Commission last week. Um, and it was, uh, I was giving, we were talking about the future, how you try to predict the future. And I was relaying to them that my um, planning, one of my, one of my planning professors when I was at the University of North Carolina <clears throat> um, had this theory that if you watch TV shows and you, you look at the uh, interrelationships of people on that television show, that's very, very popular. And that can be a predictor of, of the future. And I, I mentioned that because intergenerational families, you know, clearly occurs within um, subgroups of our, of our country. And then the types of housing or something like that would be needed for that would be, could be designed differently. And um, would be if you also um, could be considered a single family house, but if you really want to have some ability for privacy between different families, you know, it would then technically be called a, a duplex for two or a, a, um, a quad for, for four, and therefore would need a zoning change to be able to, to do that. Um, I'm wondering if there's a, there's a community out in uh, Chesterfield County off of um, Richmond Highway. And I don't know how old that community is, but it has several um, uh, multi-dwelling places that are 55 plus buildings, mm -hmm. but then they also have uh, townhouses and they have um, other units that have nothing to do with, with age. It's, um, it's, not, it not, it's not restricted to age. Mm -hmm. And then some of them are, are simply restricted for, um, or handicapped. Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I, I can think of several um, of our planned communities that have done that. Mm -hmm. I, mean, I, I think again that you're talking about kind of co-location of right. different types of types of projects, so you make it easier for families to be close together versus right. necessarily in the same housing unit that, as right. we were talking about before. So again, that's just good planning. I mean, that is just allowing diversity. The key is to have neighborhoods designed with different options for housing. And I do remember um, when I was working with the village of Midlothian on a plan way back in the 1990s that we put together a tremendous opposition as the staff had recommended apartments and townhouses. Um, but after having a discussion with them about well, where is your parents when they can't take care of property anymore? Where are they going to be able to live? And wouldn't you want to live close to them? Where is your child coming back from, um, from school that doesn't have a job right away? Or is that gonna to want to live in your, your neighborhood and be close to a job in that area? Where are they gonna be able to live? They're not gonna be able to afford to buy a nice big single family house. So from discussion, that staff had with the community, you can convince the community to be open. So if you look at the new development in Midlothian over the last new, over the last 30 years, there are a lot of apartments, there are a lot of sing, uh, uh, townhouses, there's much more diversity in that um, neighborhood now than there was originally. Okay, good, thank you. Um, there's another question. What limitation does the state enact on smaller localities if they wanted to change their zoning. Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, Tom. I mean, like, it, localities generally have very broad authority, whether they're town, city, county, or zoning. Um, 
there's nothing in the in the code I can think of that like would restrict towns necessarily, but the general assembly could always step in whenever they wanted to, right? So if they if a town did something that they didn't the general assembly didn't support or thought was worthy of state legislation to prohibit, they always could. But uh, but generally, towns and cities and counties have very broad authority over zoning. Right. Yeah. It, it, there's a lot of creativity allowed for every local government in Virginia in terms of how you design your plan for development as well as your implementation ordinances, your 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 zoning ordinance to go with it. So there's a there's a lot, there's a wide range of ways to address your individual issues in your community. Okay. Um, I have one. Uh, I don't do you have any other questions in chat? I do, have, I do have another one. Okay, good. Okay, how do localities determine the parameters around zoning updates? For example, targeted AMI, density bonus amount, and percentage that must be affordable. Is this a science that planners understand in smaller localities? <laughs> okay. Matt, I'll give you time to think about this one. I'll, I'll maybe jump in. So. Um, the, the focus of local government is on guiding new new development, right? Or the plan deals with uh, uh, renovation improvements, and maybe it deals with uh, different uh, approaches to housing. But the zoning ordinance itself is is um, geared towards what types of uses are going to go on the land, what types of of um, housing units, duplexes, single family houses, uh, um, you know, uh, uh, three story apartment buildings, those, those type. So the um, the planners, when they will put the land use plan together, you know, are not purposely looking at, is this an expensive house or is this a low expensive house? What AMI, what, what, what income range are you? The planners do not do that in terms of, now I, I will, um, not say that I know of any that have, have used that as a criteria. If you're really looking at the equity issue in an existing community, there may be done homework done as part of that, but you still have to figure out how to translate the desired um, um, incomes of people to create income mix into the types of housing that you're going to build and the location of those housing units. Yeah, um, I, th I think, and I'm sure Tom knows this better than I do, I mean, localities often pay attention to what other localities are doing. So, you know, up here in Northern Virginia, you know, if Arlington passes missing middle, I'm sure Alexandria or Fairfax or other places will be thinking about whether they want to do that. And if so, would it be different than what Arlington did? And if so, what ways? Um, so that also applies to affordable housing and how much bonus density they would provide for units up to certain amounts of a AMI, things like that. And, you know, as a locality is going through these zoning ordinance changes, I think they, they do that kind of panoramic study. They look at the literature and they, and they talk to the community and figure out, you know, what sort of goals does the community have? How much density do they want in these projects? Um, that sort of thing. So it's, it's very much a collaborative process with the community and also uh, the region and, and what other localities are doing. So people, you know, will often up here in Northern Virginia see, you know, what is Seattle doing on ADUs? What is Portland doing on ADUs? What did Minneapolis do when they allow duplexes and triplexes and single family zones, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. So it's very much a, you know, they, they have the authority to set the parameters more or less as they see fit. Mm -hmm. And they do that by talking to community and seeing kind of what other localities are doing. Mm -hmm. Speaking of that, Matt, um, let me ask you about the, you, you mentioned Roanoke um, is adding a uh, piece in their, um, you know, comprehensive plan about equity or equality. I mean, I, can you, can you, do you know a little bit more about that or, or like, what's the genesis? How did that, who's, who initiated that and how did that all come about? Do you know? Yeah, I don't. I don't know the full backstory. I actually saw the city of Roanoke zoning, zoning administrator last week. I had to go to the conference in Roanoke and I met him and, and talked to him very briefly. 
and didn't get the full backstory, but he was very proud of what they've done. And they've also been very uh, creative in how to allow ADUs in the locality as well. And I'd be happy to send you the link to the, their conference and plan after this. But basically the gist of it was saying, you know, we recognize that there's been, that zoning played a part in racial segregation in Ro the city of Roanoke throughout its history. Mm -hmm. uh, recognizing that, you know, here are the steps we can take to address it and how we can create better neighborhoods in the city. Um, I don't remember, I don't have all the details in front of me, but I'm happy to pass that along. But they did enact this as part of their 2040 conference of plan update. So it is in there. Yeah, I, I just wondered if it was, you know, it happened through staff or it was, you know, somebody pushing it, an advocate pushing it, or how did it all come about? It's very interesting. Yeah, and I could reach out to the zoning administrator and see if you can give me more information. Okay, great. Thank you. All right. Other yes, we have another question. Um, Oregon eliminated single family zoning. Any idea how Virginia feels about this? <laughs> Maybe Alice has a better opinion of that. <laughs> uh, yeah, it was a very, uh, uh, it was statewide, statewide um, 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 law that affects all, all localities. So and I don't I, remember. I don't, I mean, is it, is it like what Minneapolis did? Do you know? Similar, similar. Um, Matt, I mean, you may have the details. I don't have the details on top of my head. Um, it may have been just duplexes and they may have some nuances, uh, you know, kind of with, with what they did, but it was a, a mandating localities to eliminate single family zoning. Yeah, I don't know all the details, but one thing, you know, I think, you know, as you all talk to your neighbors and your friends and, and your local electeds, that the way I like to think about it is I don't like to think of it as eliminating single family zoning because often you can still build single family housing there. It's legalizing housing. It's legalizing duplexes, triplexes, mm -hmm. uh, fourplexes. So it's, you know, I hear that all the time up here in Arlington when people are talking about missing middle, how it's gonna eliminate single family zoning. I think at the end of the day, you can still build a single family house. You just have more options and more, because more housing's been legalized. Right, right. That's, that's good. Anything else, Carol? No, that seems to be it. All right. Well, um, we are um, uh, finished our session on uh, zoning. And I want to really thank Tom and Matt for their presentations. I think they did a really good job. And um, I, hope it, I hope everybody got something out of it. And Carol is going to put the link to um, the evaluation in the chat. Right, Carol? I did at the beginning and I'm getting okay. ready to do it again. Just a minute. Okay. Um, yep, so that you is. can okay. just quickly go on and um, uh, pull it up. And it's very, it's very brief. So I appreciate everybody coming and um, you uh, can all go and have dinner now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> thank, thank you very much, everyone. Thank you for your interest, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Great. Bye. Bye. Thank you.